Well, we can go ahead and jump into this. Uh, the uncertainty analysis that we're talking about is for a calibration system where a 9118A horizontal furnace is being used to provide a heat or a temperature for a comparison calibration. The readout is a Fluke 1586A super DAC, which has a um, primary channel connected directly to the meter, and then it has a multiplexer box on top of it um, where additional thermocouple channels or th th additional channels are located. This probe is a 5650 Type S thermocouple that has been calibrated in a fixed point calibration process here at Fluke. And the unit under test is a Type S thermocouple. The goal with this uncertainty analysis is to present what we feel uh, a comprehensive uncertainty analysis that can be fairly easily adapted to work with the equipment that, that you have. So some other equipment options that we often see people using for calibrating thermocouples are in these bottom pictures. Um, in the left-hand side, there's a black stack system that has a little bit better accuracy than the, than the 1586A, but less channels. Um, there's a st stirred liquid bath that's used for lower temperature thermocouple calibrations, a 917X dry block calibrator. It's a very popular option that's more portable for calibrating thermocouples in, in the on-site or in the field. A 5624 high, high temperature PRT will provide better accuracies than a type S thermocouple, but it only goes up to well, it's calibrated up to 962 degrees Celsius. And then the 8508A precision uh, multimeter is world-class at measuring uh, vo voltage, but it doesn't have uh, any thermocouple uh, mathematics built into it. We happen That's what we use in our laboratory for, for our fixed-point calibrations of noble metal thermocouples is an 8508A. All right. So with that out of the way, now we can jump into this. Um, oh, sorry, I need to describe a little bit more of what our calibration is that we're doing. It's, a again, a comparison calibration where the unit under test is compared with a reference temperature probe. The unit under test will not be, uh, we won't take data to calculate um, a new curve for it or a characterization for it. Um, if you have questions about that, um, that was... Uh, that would require almost a separate webinar in itself to talk about the mathematics involved and how to do that. Um, but we have some tools that we can help you with that if you're if you're doing that in your laboratory. For this example, we will be setting the UUT to measure in units of temperature by selecting the type S curve that's built into the 1586, and we'll just be che checking the unit under test against a uh, ASTM standard to make sure that it's in specification. The measurement points are shown here in 200 degree increments from 200 up to 1000. Just to mix it up a little bit, we will be working with an external reference junction for the reference probe and an internal reference junction for the unit under test. So here's the uncertainty analysis. And uh, so you can kind of see what it looks like and what the different parameters are that we have loaded into it. Um, we'll be going through each one th through this presentation and explaining it uh, more in depth. Um, just for clarification purposes, we are going to show you both the standard uncertainty, so you can see that in the standard uncertainty column, and the expanded uncertainty for each uncertainty. Usually, we don't do this in, in uncertainty analyses because it can sometimes it can get a little confusing. But we thought for this webinar, we would um, show both, um, and we're also showing the coverage factor or divisor that's used to convert from. Usually, it's used to convert from expanded uncertainty down to standard uncertainty. Um, so, um, I already realized that was, this is all brand new material we just started presenting. And I realized I should have, I need to put uh, what um, confidence interval we, we list for the expanded uncertainty. Um, but uh, 
we will uh, talk about that a little bit here down the road. Okay, so so now I can go ahead and dive into um, the first two uncertainties, the measurement noise. So, oh, okay, that. Sorry, I forgot. I have a little refresher <laughs> slide here. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time to go into great detail in how to uh, work in a gum compliant or a gum type uncertainty analysis. The, the gum I'm referring to is the International Guide for Uncert Uncertainty and Measurement. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the gum, I recommend you go to the BIPM website. Um, if you're in the United States, you can go to the NIST website and they have some, some more information about the gum and how to calculate uncertainties in accordance with the gum. But um, this slide represents the two types of distributions that we'll be working with today in our uncertainty analysis. The first one is normal distribution. This represents, I, I think normal distribution represents what most uncertainties are. Um, to work with a normal distribution uncertainty, um, it's fairly simple. If you have an expanded uncertainty, like, like for example, at k equals 2 or 95% coverage, you can easily convert that to a standard uncertainty by dividing by the k value, by, or in other words, dividing by 2 to convert it to a k equals 1 or standard uncertainty value. Uh, the reason why we need to do this is because the gum recommend or requires that you combine uncertainties when they are in their standard form or their k equals one distribution rectangular distribution is a little different to convert a rectangular distri distribution uncertainty to a standard uncertainty you can you can do that by dividing it by the square root of three uh, rectangular distribution uncertainties are often things like limits. If there is a drift limit, um, then you will probably use that as a rectangular distribution. So again, divide it by the square root of 3 to convert it to a standard uncertainty. Also, uh, a basic rule of thumb about uncertainty analysis is, is if you don't know what the distribution is, if the literature you're reading or the specs you are reading don't make it really clear what the distribution is, then you can assume rectangular um, to be very safe and uh, it's, a, it's a conservative assumption uh, and uh, and plug it into the uncertainty analysis. Okay, now we can start talking about measurement noise. Um, now you'll notice that measurement noise is in here twice. It's in once for the stability of measuring the reference temperature and then it's also in there for measuring the stability of the unit under test temperature. So what is the uncertainty of measurement noise? Well, in the picture on the right-hand side, you can see two different sets of measurements with different amounts of noise. And when we calculate the uncertainty of noise, we don't, we don't take the peak-to-peak -peak, um, deviation of, of the measurements, we actually calculate the standard deviation of the mean. Something important to consider when we are looking at this noise uncertainty is that it actually covers two things. It covers readout noise, as the readout is measuring the probe. Um, so if there is any noise created by the probe itself, there, there, there shouldn't be because the probe is a passive device, but it could act like an antenna um, and transfer noise into the readout. So the, so the readout will, will uh, try to handle that, but we'll have some noise. But then the other part of this is the heat source stability, um, which is an important thing to consider. But um, that's why we recommend that you, whenever you are taking measurements in a system like this, that you always take more than one reading. Um, in this example, we recommend that you take at least 30 readings or 30 samples and then calculate the mean or average of those 30 samples. Uh, when you're using an instrument like a 1586A or maybe you have some calibration software, um, you can use the measurement standard deviation statistic field 
to give you an idea of how stable the measurement is. If you record the measurement standard deviation, then you can easily calculate standard deviation of the mean with the formula that we show here. Standard deviation of the mean is, is simply the measurement standard deviation divided by the square root of n, which is n is the, the number of samples um, taken to calculate the average or the mean. In this case, um, to make our uncertainty analysis simple and not have to change it um, with every calibration that we that we run, we set the standard deviation limit to be 0 0.05 degrees Celsius, and we take readings until we see a an average or a mean of 30 samples that has a standard deviation of 0 0.05 degrees C or better. The benefit of this approach is that you establish the standard deviation limit as you are building the system and designing it. And then as someone uses it, if they see that um, the standard deviation is higher than 0 0.05, then they will stop and uh, ask questions, and, and then you go into troubleshooting mode to find out why, why the system is not working as, as well as it had previously. So that's why we recommend setting a standard deviation limit Plus, you can just put it right into the uncertainty analysis. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to take this uh, value, 0 0.009, and plug it into the uncertainty analysis. So you'll see that come up here in the next slide. Now, 0 0.009, when you round it to two decimal places, changes to 0 0.01. So you'll see that in the standard uncertainty column, um, 0 0.01 for measurement noise for the reference probe and for the unit under test. Whenever possible, you should always measure in a calibration system using a check standard to keep an eye on the process. So we have a check standard statistic that we've plugged in here. So let's talk about it. A check standard is a, another probe that should be similar to the unit under test so that it will be sensitive to the same changes in the process that the unit under test would be sensitive to. So in this case, if, if, you're cal if the unit under test is a type S thermocouple, then it makes sense that the check standard would be a type S thermocouple. Um, and to work with a check standard, you, treat, you put it in, uh, in the calibration run just like it, it's a UUT, and you take data on it, and uh, for, you... Um, when you take data on it, you record the, the mean at each temperature point, and you put that mean into a control chart so that over time you can see how repeatable the process is through the check standard reading. Um, the other thing that the check standard does for you, and then the reason why it's important to be the same as the unit under test, is because the, the check standard can represent non-repeatability of the unit under test, which is a, an important topic for thermocouples. Thermocouples are not repeatable devices when, when you compare them with other temperature probes. Well, when you get down into lower temperatures and really small temperature ranges, then maybe you could argue that some types of thermocouples are, are, are almost as repeatable as a PRT. But in general, though, thermocouples are, they have significant non-repeatability. And this control chart will um, have that included in it because the unit under test by being a thermocouple will not be, uh, will have a non-repeatability and it will show up in the control chart. So um, that's one of the, uh, I guess the good thing and the bad thing about using a unit under test that's the same as, or sorry, a check standard that's the same as the unit under test because your check standard may not be very repeatable, but um, in this case, that's a benefit, though, because it helps us. Um, it This check standard statistic can then account for process variability from run to run plus um, non-repeatability of the unit under test. If you were going to use a different check standard, like maybe a PRT or something, which we wouldn't recommend, um, and it does not have this non-repeatability, then you would need a separate uncertainty in this uncertainty analysis that would be called something along the lines of non-repeatability uh, of the unit under test. Okay. 
One more thing about the check standard data. Um, as you gather data points over time, we have seven different runs here that were taken over about a two-month period. You can see the date here in this control chart. Um, we calculate the standard deviation of these seven data point, uh, these seven uh, readings um, or measurement points, and the standard deviation uh, represents the process variability, and we plug that into the uncertainty analysis for the check standard statistic. Also, the control lines you see over here on the left side in this graph, they are based on that standard deviation that we see in the right-hand side. Um, these control lines are set at, uh, oh, if I remember correctly, these are set at K equals 3 for a 99% coverage of this on this control chart. And these control lines help us because if we see a point that goes outside of the control lines, then we stop and we check the system and start troubleshooting. So check standards are very, very, very um, useful, and uh, we highly recommend using one whenever possible. So now you see the check standard statistic when we round it to um, two decimal places, it's 0 0.01. Now we can move into some of uh, the other types of uncertainties, which are now related to the equipment. So now we're going to talk about the 1586A readout accuracy. The same readout is being used to measure the reference probe and the UUT, so we'll be covering both B1 and B3 um, with the next few slides. The 1586A um, measures both resistance and voltage. Since we're measuring a thermocouple, we need to know the voltage accuracy of the 1586A. To convert the voltage accuracy to a, uh, an accuracy in units of temperature, like degrees Celsius, we divide the, uh, the voltage accuracy by the sensitivity, or the Seebeck, or the slope, or a few different terms used to describe this term. Um, we divide the voltage accuracy by the slope of the thermocouple at the temperature we are interested in. This is important for thermocouples because the slope of the thermocouple is not the same over the whole temperature. So if you, at whatever temperature you are working with, in this case 1000 degrees Celsius, you need to go find what the specific slope is at that temperature. Otherwise, you will make some mistakes in your calculations. So. Um, we have a tip here where if you don't know what the slope is of your thermocouple at, at the different temperatures, it's it's a very easy thing to calculate by using a typical temperature versus voltage table like the one you see here. This is just a cutout view of one. Normally, this one would have um, temperature versus voltage from 0 Celsius all the way up to um, 14, uh, 1,450 degrees Celsius. But we're interested in 1,000 degrees C is, is where we want to calculate the slope. So to do that, we take the voltage at 1,000 degrees C, which is in the left-hand column under the zero. The voltage is 9.58558. And down here at the bottom of the table, you can see where I've, I've done this calculation. So I plug in the voltage at 1,000 degrees Celsius, and I subtract from it the voltage at 999 degree C, which is which is all the way to, on the right-hand column under the 9 and and the, on the row for 990. So you can see as you go from left to right, uh, the temperature goes from 990 up to 999. So we calculate the difference in voltage between 1000 degree C and 999 degree C because the difference there is, is 1 degree Celsius. So the difference in voltage is, is the slope. It's 0 0.0115 millivolts per degree C. Now we can start talking about um, the 1586A accuracy. Um, the accuracy on channel 1, which is the channel that's directly on the readout, is 0.004% of reading plus 4 microvolts. The reference probe will be on channel 1, so that's the voltage accuracy we need to work with. 
The unit under test, however, is going to be on channel one of the of the scanner box that's on, on that's attached to the 1586A. The scanner channels require an additional two microvolts to be added to the accuracy on channel one. You also see here the uh, reference junction accuracy of the 1586A. We'll cover that uh, here in a, a down the road a bit. So now we can start, now that we know what the spec is and we know what the slope is, now we can calculate what the accuracy spec is in temperature. So first, we um, take the voltage at 1,000 degrees C and we round it to 9.6 millivolts. You don't have to use a lot of resolution there with this calculation. So 9.6 millivolts is the reading. So we calculate 0.004% of that reading and we add to it 0 0.004 millivolts. Um, again, that comes from the previous slide, the accuracy statement. Now, it doesn't show it here, but these uh, if, if I would have copied in more of the specs table, we would see that these are all K equals 2 specs, by the way. So, all right, back to our calculation. So, we use this first formula to convert our 9.6 millivolt value, or sorry, to calculate the accuracy at 9.6 millivolts, which is plus or minus 0 0.0044 millivolts. And that's the K equals 2 accuracy. So if we divide that by 2, we, we get the K equals 1 accuracy. Now we take the K equals 1 accuracy and we convert it to temperature by dividing it by the slope of the thermocouple and that leaves us with 0.19 degrees Celsius. <clears throat> and that's what we're going to plug into the uncertainty analysis. So you'll see that plugged in right here on the row with B1 for the reference probe. We do the same thing for the unit under test, but remember it has an extra 2 microvolts of accuracy. So the, the difference that 2 microvolts makes is it bumps it up to 0.28 degrees C for the unit under test. All right, now we're going to be talking about the reference junctions. But first, we're going to have a little bit of a refresher here on what we're talking about when we talk about a reference junction. There are two junctions in every thermocouple. By, by nature of, of how they work, you have to have a measurement junction, which is the part that goes into whatever you're measuring. And usually it's going into a hot or high temperature, so people often call it the hot junction. And then you have the cold junction or, or the reference junction, and it's called that because usually it's put into a bath, an ice bath at zero degrees C. But nowadays it's often connected directly to the readout and so it's it's at about 25 degrees C. So when we calc when we measure the thermocouple, basically it's the temperature difference between these two junctions is what we end up measuring. Um, now, if you attended our other webinar, you'll know that it's actually not that simple. Unfortunately, it's fairly complicated on exactly how we get voltage from thermocouples. But but from this point of view, we're talking about why we have these two junctions. Okay, now it's important to understand that when you are measuring the thermocouple, because you are measuring the, the potential difference between these two junctions, um, they both interact with each other, or, or they are both involved in, in every measurement. So when you're calculating uncertainty of the reference junction, you actually have to consider the sensitivity of both junctions, and I'll show you what I mean in this formula coming up. Oh, sorry, one more slide later. Uh, we want to want to show you a, a little bit more about the difference between an external reference junction and an internal reference junction. Um, on the left side is an internal reference junction. This is where the thermocouple is connected directly to the meter, and because the thermocouple wire is touching usually copper wire or a copper connector in the therm in the meter, it's creating a thermocouple junction. So we we need to carefully measure the temperature of that junction and apply a correction to any readings we get on the thermocouple 
um, to make sure we get the the right value, the correct value out of it. So here's a circuit showing where the connection happens, and then right next to the connection is a temperature sensor that's built in, into the readout. And up here in this picture is an actual uh, uh, picture of a reference junction system. You can it's kind of hard to see probably on on your screen, but the thermocouple wires are connected to a connection block here, and then in the middle of the uh, of this uh, this is this is a high capacity module used on the on the 1586a um, anyway in the in the center of the high capacity module is a temperature sensor that's that's monitoring the the temperature inside um, this little box or this module on the right hand side is more as a traditional reference junction this is a a junction where copper wires are attached to the thermocouple wires. Um, in our laboratory, we solder them to the thermocouple wires, and then we put the reference junction down inside of an ice bath like you see in this picture. It's just a Dewar flask filled with um, ice and water, ice that has been ground in a snow cone machine and mixed with some water. So now we can get to the formula for calculating the uncertainty of the reference junction. So first we're going to tackle the external reference junction, which is an ice bath. We have assigned an accuracy of our ice bath, which is 0 0.025 degrees C, rectangular distribution. Um, you can actually do a lot better than this. We're take, kind of taking the easy route with a, a fairly large spec here of 0 0.025. Um, ASTM has a really good guide on how to make a really reliable and low uncertainty ice bath. Um, but at any rate, um, we're using an ice bath with 0 0.025 degrees C accuracy. Um, what we do in our laboratory is put a thermistor probe in the ice bath to t keep an eye on it to make sure that it uh, um, stays within 0 0.025 degrees C because we there have been a couple of times we've had some things happen to our ice bath and luckily we we saw the change with the, with the temperature probe being in there we need to know the sensitivity of the thermocouple at both the major junction so at 1000 degrees C and then also at the re at the reference junction which is at 0 degrees C so we we do the same calculation that I showed you earlier and we find the sensitivity at, at both temperatures then we plug the the two sensitivities or slopes into this formula that's that's calculating the effective uncertainty of the reference junction and you'll notice that um, in this particular measurement where we're we have one at one at one junction at 1000 degrees C and the other one at zero the uncertainty the effect of the uncertainty of the reference junction is reduced because of that relationship so it goes from 0 0.025 down to 0 0.012 then to convert that from a rec from its rectangular expanded form to a standard uncertainty, we divide it by the square root of three, and we get 0 0.007. Now we're going to talk about the internal reference junction. This is where we're connecting the thermocouple directly to the 1586A. The 1586A, um, when we looked at the spec sheet earlier, uh, it said that the internal reference junction accuracy is 0 0.25 degrees C so um, it's quite a has a quite a bit larger uncertainty than the external junction we apply the same math but this time we calculate the sensitivity of the reference junction at 25 degrees C because that's that's the temperature of it it's not it's no longer at 0 degrees C and run it through the same formula the effective uncertainty of the reference junction is 0.13 degrees C. Um, in this case, it's a K equals 2 uncertainty, so we divide it by 2 to convert it to K equals 1, so it's at 0.07. And you should see that here at um, B2 is for the external reference junction, and B4 is for the internal reference junction. Now we're going to talk about the reference probe calibration uncertainty. This probe was calibrated by fixed point in our laboratory, and you can get the uh, 
So you so you get the measurement uncertainty f directly from the Cal report. Um, in this case, at 1,000 degrees C, the listed uncertainty is 0 0.26 degrees C, K equals 2. Um, a tip here is if the calibration report doesn't list the uncertainty at the at a particular temperature point you need, you uh, a shortcut method to to a, to get to the uncertainty that you need at at a temperature specific temperature point is to take the larger of the two surrounding uncertainties. So, for example, um, this thermocouple was calibrated by fixed point, so we have um, an uncertainty at the aluminum point at 660 degrees C. And then we have an uncertainty at the silver point, which is 962 degrees C. So if we were interested in um, the uncertainty at 800 degrees C, which is between aluminum and, and silver, to be safe, we would just take the uncertainty from the silver point and, and apply it to 800 degrees C. Um, I guess I should have a little visual of ex exactly how that happens here. The other thing to consider, too, with the reference probe is uh, make sure that the uh, calibration uncertainty accounts for inhomogeneity, which in this case it does. Um, in our laboratory, when we calibrate thermocouples, we, we check uh, homogeneity, make sure um, we know what, what it's doing, and then we uh, put, it, put a value in the uncertainty analysis for it. Um, if, if you've had a calibration done where there is no mention of uh, in homogeneity, then you will probably have to do a, a, a homogeneity scan yourself to find out um, how homogeneous the wire is. Uh, the reason why that's important is because thermocouple homo in homogeneity um, usually applies to a particular section of the wire, and in different measurement scenarios, um, different sections of the wire are exposed to different gradients. This this is something we talk about in the other webinar. Um, and it ends up causing non-repeatability from one system to another. So that's why it's an important thing to, to understand when you're working with thermocouples. Um, also related to the reference probe is long-term drift. Um, in this case, we are using a Fluke 5650 reference grade type S thermocouple. Um, Fluke where we say that the long-term drift is around 0 0.5 degrees C at 1100. Um, this particular thermocouple that we, we looked at f to get data to plug into this uncertainty budget, um, it showed a drift of 0 0.1 degrees C between calibrations. But we have to be careful with this. This could be, um, this can be a little deceptive because Thermocouple drift depends mostly on its on the usage of the thermocouple. the The great thing about thermocouples is they are very um, resistant to changes caused by um, vibration or bumping them. You know, unlike a PRT, which is very sensitive to that. But the but the bad part about thermocouples is that they change as they are used at higher temperatures. They um, oxidation and metal migration causes them to drift. So, so this drift value can be a little tricky because it will vary a lot depending on how much the thermocouple is used. We know some laboratories that only use their reference grade thermocouple three or four times a year at 1000 degrees C. We know other laboratories that use their reference grade thermocouple every day to 1000 degrees C. So of course the drift rates between those two that those two labs will see are going to be very very different. So this this is kind of a, a tricky one to to nail down, and you, and hopefully you already have some data that you can you can analyze the drift of your thermocouple and determine for your for your own labs use what what drift to use. In this case, we're using 0 0.1 degrees C, and because it's a drift limit, we're treating it as a rectangular, so we'll divide it by the square root of three to convert it to a standard uncertainty. Um, it's always good to try to monitor the drift of your reference probe. It's it's a little harder with thermocouples because of their high temperature use. Um, that, what we recommend is 
using a fixed point cell to check your reference thermocouple. Um, if you don't have a, a fixed point cell, then maybe you can check it against a high temperature PRT or a high temperature SPRT. Um, you know, so try to find a way to check it. If your reference probe is a PRT or SPRT, it's a little simpler to track for a long-term drift. You you can uh, just use a triple point of water cell to keep an eye on the drift. So, um, so we plugged in 0 0.06 degrees C reference probes long-term drift. Um, now we're down to our last two uncertainties and are both related to the heat source. Um, some of you may be asking, we see uniformity for the heat source there, but we but we don't see uh, heat source stability, which is quite uh, which is a very important spec. And the reason why you don't see it down here in the heat source section is because we already covered the heat source stability at the top with A1 and A2, which is uh, measurement noise, because part of the measurement noise is um, stability of the heat source. So that's so. St Stability is already accounted for up above. So now we can just focus on uniformity. Um, axial and radial uniformity describe how consistent temperature is throughout a furnace's measurement area. Basically, um, the impact of, of non-uniformity in a measurement area is possibly the two probes that we're trying to compare against each other are not seeing the same temperature. And so there can be errors caused by non-uniformity of, of the temperature, or in other words, the um, uh, axial and radial uniformity. When you're using a heat source like this horizontal furnace, the 9118, um, here are a couple of pieces of advice we have for you. Um, if you are using it as an open cavity, which is how you often see horizontal furnaces. They just have a big open tube in the center that's a few centimeters in diameter. Uh, we recommend that you bundle the unit under test uh, probes around the reference probe. And you can see that in the bottom left-hand picture where someone has bundled these probes together and then you put them inside the, the cavity. This helps reduce effects from non-uniformity in that cavity. Um, of course, if you're using an equilibration block, like in the picture on the right-hand side, that helps simplify things. The, the equilibration block also helps to hold the probes, so you don't have to worry about trying to suspend them um, inside the cavity. But then um, the equilibration block from hole to hole will have non-uniformities. Um, another important thing to consider when you're using a heat source is when you transition from one temperature to another, that you will see fairly good measurement stability before you will see good uniformity in the furnace. And this graph shows that. If you, look, if you watch the red line as, you, as it transitions up to 500 degrees C, it overshoots a little bit, but then it stabilizes fairly quickly so that you're, you're, if you were sampling uh, over a period of time, you would see really good stability. But the blue line shows that um, the blue line was a little bit higher for a significant period of time and eventually as the uniformity settles in and we reach thermal equilibrium then we finally can take readings so so it's important to to allow the furnace enough time after it reaches a set point that even though you see really stable readings you should always wait a little bit longer to make sure that you also see, have really good uniformity, because that is not so easy to see. So how do we calculate the uncertainty for axial and radial uniformity? Well, usually you, you get this information from the manufacturer, but you always need to verify your, um, your own equip the equipment in your own laboratory, because you never know, maybe, the, maybe there's something and it doesn't have the uniformity that um, is published in the specifications. Um, or maybe the manufacturer isn't really clear about the uniformity of the, of the heat source, and so you just study it yourself. Um, 
in this case though we're going to take the spec from the manufacturer and then of course in our laboratory we would make measurements to verify that these specs apply um, so we look at the spec table and we see that don't have a radial uniformity listed for 1000 degrees C it's listed at 700 and 1200 so for this scenario we are going to linearly interpolate between 700 and 1200 and, and to calculate a uniformity spec of 0.23 um, you should always check with the manufacturer though because quite often specs like these are stepped meaning um, for temperatures up to 700 the uniformity is 0 0.20 but as soon as you go above 700 then you would step up to the next spec which is 0 0.25 the axial uniformity luckily is the same over the whole temperature range but there's a little catch here that you need to uh, recognize which is the axial uniformity describes the uniformity in the the last 60 millimeters of the equilibration block um, if your temperature sensors are all long enough to reach that region then fantastic then you then that definitely applies but if you're working with shorter probes and they don't reach that far into the furnace, then you'll have to measure um, the uniformity in the area where the where the probe sensors are at or where the probes end at. Um, it's always recommended to put the reference probe in at the same depth as the unit under test, unless you reach a point where you don't have enough immersion for the reference probe. Then then you're kind of in a tricky situation. If if the unit under test is a really short probe then you may have to just add additional uncertainty to, uh, to account for the difference in depth and the difference in temperature gradient. Um, both these are k equals 2 specs, so we just divide them by 2 to get their k equals 1 component. So we're going to plug in 0 0.12 degrees C for radial uniformity and 0 0.1 degrees C for axial uniformity. So, so you see that here. Um, now we're going to talk about combining the uncertainties. When combining uncertainties, the GUM recommends that you combine non-correlated uncertainties using RSS, which is the square root of the sum of the squares. Um, if you have correlated uncertainties, meaning they are dependent or they interact with each other, in the uh, in the same way, then, or they are sensitive to the same um, uh, physical parameters, then you use linear addition. We do have correlated uncertainties in this budget. They are B1 and B3, which are the 1586A voltage accuracy, because we're using the same meter to measure both the reference probe and the unit under test. So what we're do is add B1 and B3 linearly and then RSS that with other uncertainties. Now again like I mentioned earlier when you combine uncertainties you combine the you combine them in standard uncertainty form when you're finished combining them then you multiply the total by 2 which is what most laboratories nowadays are using as a k equals 2 or 95 percent confidence interval to reach your total expanded uncertainty. Um, now, unfortunately, we, we don't have time to go into depth into some other important uncertainties to consider with thermocouples. And also, something that we'd like to hear some feedback from is uh, we we'd also don't have time in this 45-minute uh, window to talk about some of the other equipment used in more industrial-type thermocouple calibrations like thermocouple simulators or process calibrators. So we're contemplating putting together a webinar that would be specifically for that type of equipment because it's it's a completely different ball game when you're calibrating thermocouples um, in a factory that's you know using a uh, a uh, transmitter or something. So if, anyway, if you have some feedback on that let us know. Um, but uh, some other uncertainties to consider. I already mentioned inhomogeneity. Um, there is a there is some good information out there on how to do your own homogeneity tests. Um, the problem is you have to have some fairly sophisticated equipment 
to do to do a really good homogeneity scan, you can do a simple one by just running a heat gun along the thermocouple to watch for temperature changes. Um, ASTM E220-02 has a pretty good um, recommended practice for measuring or checking wire homogeneity. Um, another uncertainty that we don't talk about here is if you're using extension wire. Um, we, we recommend that you um, carefully consider the, the specifications of the extension wire. Um, ASTM ASTM recommends that uh, you don't have to worry about additional uncertainty with extension wire as long as the the uh, wire is kept in a a uniform temperature area that is um, that has changes of or differences of less than one degree C. Um, thermocouple connectors uh, may also be an additional source of uncertainty depending on the type of connector you're using. Um, and de depending on how well you can control temperature gradients on the connector. And then, of course, there are other types of reference junctions, like sometimes we'll see people using calibrated reference junctions so that they can plug in um, these thermocouples that have connectors molded onto them. You can't, you can't easily take the connector off and attach a reference junction. So in some cases, people are using a uh, it's basically a calibrated reference junction system where they then compensate for uh, any temperatures that they observe on the reference junction. So with that, um, oh, uh, one more thing is if you want to improve upon these uncertainties that you see in this uncertainty analysis, you can do that by using a more accurate meter like the Fluke 2565. It's about twice as accurate as the meter we looked at in this example. Um, its reference junction accuracy um, is actually about five times more accurate than the 1586, but it has less channels. It only has two channels, so it's you kind of have to pick which way you want to go there. Um, you could also improve a lot by using a better reference probe, like a high-temperature PRT, um, but the high-temperature PRT only goes up to, it's calibrated up to 962 degrees C, so if you're if you want to measure the full range of a type S thermocouple, then you wouldn't be able to do it with the 5624. Um, but you could also do other things too, like use uh, um, an 85 voltage measurements, but then you, you don't have um, the option to scan channels and, and measure multiple unit, units under test. So um, that is all of the technical material we had prepared for today. Here are the references that I mentioned earlier if you want to do some more reading or if you need some more questions answered. Uh, these are some great resources. Um, and of course, you can also go out and read. Um, we, we go over a lot of the same information in these application notes that Travis mentioned earlier. It's a series of four application notes on calibrating thermocouples. Um, and hopefully that'll help answer your questions. But, but ultimately, if you need help, give us a call or email us. We're happy, happy to help you out. So now we'll switch over to do Q and A. I'll let Travis jump back on here. All right, thanks, Mike. Um, I've been keeping track of the questions. The first one that came through at the beginning of the uh, presentation was from Laura. She was wanting to know if these methods can be used for field instrument calibration system uncertainty analysis. Uh, that's a good question. Um, it depends on the type of calibration you're doing in the field. If, if you're taking the the thermocouple out of whatever th thing it's installed in and, and you're putting it into a furnace to measure it, then then almost all of these uncertainties apply. Uh, heat source uniformity, uh, readout accuracy, um, reference junction accuracy, um, accuracy of the reference probe. So, so it's all very applicable. To, um, if you are leaving the thermocouple embedded into whatever system you're measuring, then it, then it will change a little bit, especially if you start simulating the thermocouple for the transmitter or for the, the controller that it's, that's connected to it. 
All right. The second one was from Pradeed. Uh, he wanted to know where, uh, basically I read into the question, I think we may have lost something in translation. Where are all these uncertainties has to take? I'm um, thinking he's wanting to know what, like how many pieces you have to consider in the uncertainty analysis, uh, which I think you touched on in the, the one slide as we broke it down, but maybe you want to touch on that again as far as everything you have to consider in the uncertainty. Um. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how to answer that, but basically, in a typical uh, temperature calibration scenario, especially in in most cases, we are doing comparison calibrations. So, um, you have to account for heat source uncertainties. You have to account for the measurement equipment uncertainties, so the the readouts. Uh, maybe in some cases, like in this one, maybe only one readout is used, but in other cases, maybe two readouts are used. And then, and then uncertainties related to the reference probe um, is kind of the general you know, basic set for almost every temperature calibration. All right. Uh, the next question came from uh, Robert. Um, he wanted to know if uh, this presentation would be available for download. I can take that one. Uh, yeah, we are recording, and we will provide the uh, recorded session and the slides uh, going forward. I am Steve Potter, who is typically the host. Typically, we'll sum these up, and then anybody who's registered for the seminar, he will email this uh, out to you. Uh, the next question that we uh, came across from Isaac uh, is wanted to know, are the fluke, axial, and radial uniformity specifications always published as K equals 2, uh, even with other equipment like metrology wells, dry wells? Um, our engineers tell us that they are. Um, the problem is in a lot of our spec tables and manuals, the engineers didn't specifically state K equals 2. But every time I've I've asked, um, they've told me that yes, they are k equals two. Um, that's the best best answer I have there. If you if you have more specifics on a particular piece of equipment, oh, and I recognize that name. Hope everything's going well for you, Isaac. <laughs> All right, and then we have uh, another one. Uh, he was asking if uh, it was from Isaac again. If when placing the TC junction in an ice bath, do you put it directly in the water, or is it encased in some sort of a tube or uh, encapsulation? Uh, very good question, and that also answers a question from Slava that I see where he's he asked the same question for isolating the joints. Um, yeah, first of all, the uh, so in our laboratory when we we build a reference junction, we solder copper wires to the thermocouple wire, then we put heat shrink over. Um, each solder joint so that they can't touch each other. Then we put the wire, this wire assembly down inside a, either a glass tube or a metal tube um, and put it down into the water. So very, very, very good questions. Again, it looks like we got a, another um, question about the presentation. Again, yes, this will be uh, sent out. Um, and we will provide the, the slides as well. Um, there is one from an Alberto Salazar. Uh, says, when can I use the uncertainty depend and no depend? Um, I'm not sure exactly what is meant by that. Um, I don't know if you can read into that, Mike. Bigger. When? Um, uh, that can be complicated to uh, to know if if a, if an uncertainty is dependent or independent. Um, I, I would recommend uh, talking to um, a lab or someone at a laboratory with a good reputation. You know, certainly you could contact us, and we could help you. Um, sometimes read literature, like you can. Uh, NIST does a pretty good job of presenting their uncertainty analyses for, sim you know, thermal calibration or SPRT calibration, and they will recommend. Um, or can give you some in, um, uh, some advice on um, dependent versus um, codependent um, uh, uncertainties. Of course, as you dig deeper into uncertainty analysis, it gets more complicated. Then, um, in some cases, well, there is some codependency on it with uncertainties. Then you you may have to mathematically model them if you want to get down to really small details. Um, at this level, we're talking about with this uncertainty analysis, though we we're not going to worry about that. But um, the gum has 
and and others who other people who are experts on gum uncertainty analysis have a lot of recommendations on how to how to work with um, variables that are that are like that or uncertainties that are like that. All right, and then we have a question. Uh, it says, how is it possible to calculate the sensitivity of the thermocouple? I think you touched on that on the yeah. slope and sensitivity. Let me go back up to that one more time, really quick, because I I went through things quickly. I I'm happy to go back. Um, so, to calculate the slope, the easiest way to do it is to use a temperature versus voltage table, like the one you see at the bottom of this slide. Um, a table like this should provided with almost every thermocouple calibration I've ever seen. A table like this. You don't. It, uh, you don't. Um, don't worry. You can. You can go to NIST's website, and they have a nice uh, calculator on their website. I think we even have a calculator on our website somewhere. I'm not sure exactly where it's at. You. You select the the type of thermocouple you're working with, and then the calculator will allow you to enter a temperature that you want. We would find out what the volt. Uh, if, for example, like in this case, we want to know the slope at 1,000 degrees C. So we find out what the voltage is at 1,000 degrees C, and then we find out what the voltage is at at a temperature that's one degree away from 1,000, so either 999 or 1,001. Um, luckily, the slope is consistent enough. We, we can go either direction um, there and, and arrive at a very good ec uh, uh, estimate. Anyway, but it's it's just simply the difference in voltage between two temperature points that are one degree apart from each other. So the difference between 1,000 and 999 is what I did here um, to calculate a sensitivity of 0 0.0115 millivolts per degree C. All right, and then we've got one again. It said, can you expand on the reason why the CJC uncertainty is calculated using the two values, making it less than the CJC specification? I think that has to do with taking it from a k equals two or three to a one. Yeah. Um, the uh, oh shoot, it, it has to. It's because the sensitivity is so different for the thermocouple at one thousand degrees C versus um, five hundred degrees C. Uh, let me find that. Uh, where do I have that at here? Um, so the, the sensitivity one five and the sensitivity at zero is point zero zero five four. So um, the uh, um, basically the the volt the uh, the the sensitivity at one thousand degrees C is dominant, and this formula uh, takes into consideration that dominance. All right, and one question was, uh, how is it possible to calculate the... Um, it, I was, uh, ASTM has some recommendation for that. Um, basically, you, you, you expose the, the extension wire to temperature gradients, is, from what I understand. You, you put um, uh, one end in, in in one temperature, at a temperature that's uh, whatever you're interested in, that will will cover the possibilities in a laboratory. So maybe plus or minus five degrees. Um, consider that the the extension wire is usually used because it it connects to the thermocouple just as it protrudes out of the furnace. So that's that's where you start dealing with some temperature gradient. Is if you're connecting near the furnace where there will, will there will be some higher temperatures at that point and then as the extension wire is goes across possibly other equipment to the to the meter so um, I, I would recommend reading the ASTM um, e220 um, um, which is a guide for for uh, for calibrating thermal couples all right, and then uh, the question was asked: uh, When you bundle probes together, what do you use? That question came up last night, and uh, the uh, uh, I've seen 
some laboratories. We we don't in our laboratory we we're only make, calibrating by fixed point, so I don't have a lot of experience with that. But what I've read and what I've seen is you have two choices. You can bundle the the probes together, and there's a um, high temperature wrap that is used that will that will keep them together. Now, depending on how high the temperature goes, of course, you have to you, um, consider that with the material you're using, that it doesn't break down at some higher temperature. Like some of the uh, uh, materials made out of shredded quartz can have a little bit lower melting point. Um, in some laboratories, I've read that they use platinum wire to tie the, the bundle together um, because the platinum wire is... It's a noble metal. It's, it, it retains its strength and composition all the way up to really high temperatures. So we're, we're, uh, we're working on getting that. That was a question from last night's presentation, and we, we're already committed to getting some specifics on that. All right, very good. I've got one more. Uh, it says, after the uncertainty is calculated, uh, the reading of the UT has to be added Back with the uncertainty value, um, I guess is what they're saying. Does the reading of the UUT have to be added back that? with the uncertainty value? Um, no, this this uncertainty analysis is designed to to cover um, both the reading of the UUT and the reference probe. Um, I'm not sure you, if if I'm not sure if the intention of the question is. Is if you calc if you have measurement statistics that need to be loaded back into the uncertainty budget, I um, this this the way I presented this uncertainty analysis, it's it's intended to to not have to do that. That we use limits instead of actual measurement statistics. Um, I don't, I'm not sure exactly how to answer that question, but. Uh, All right, and then we had a question from John that asked, "Do you do any type A uncertainty?" Um, and actually, we we do now. Keep in mind that um, 